here is essentially give you uh, re-give the talk I gave at Scala Days. Uh, so that was last week. Uh, it was a great conference. I, I think a lot, everybody on the conference really enjoyed uh, not just this talk, but all of the talks. They were amazing. So uh, the keynote I gave there, I want to re-give here because I think that maybe there's something interesting for you here as well. I assume that most of you here are Scala programmers. So we're going to talk about Scala with style or what style to use with Scala. So um, to give you a little perspective in this talk, I'll argue that we are in a tra transition period between two programming paradigms, imperative object-oriented programming, that's what we used so far, and I think we are transitioning to more and more functional. In the end, I believe it won't be a transition that we will completely replace one, one with the other, but we'll see a fusion of these. And in this period of upheaval, which we are uh, is, is seeing right now, there are many questions of programming techniques and programming style that have to be revisited. So I want to give you my perspective on that. Um, I'm actually pretty old, uh, so I'm old enough to know the period of the last periods of upheaval that was like in the 80s when object-oriented programming took over. I was a grad student then, and uh, oh, at the last part of the 80s I was a grad student. Uh, and before that I was an undergrad, and I remember still when uh, this byte cover came out, that was in 81. I was on an internship at Siemens, I think, and I, I read this and I was fascinated, but also thoroughly confused methods, messages, objects, what were they talking about? It was very, very weird, but somehow fascinating. So that was the uh, whole issue of the Byte magazine, which was the, the premier magazine for developers of the, day, of, of the time about small talk. Uh, so now I have a question for you. What was the first object in the programming language? Simona Z, yeah. yeah. You didn't fall for small talk, even though I sort of <laughs> <laughs> led you to that. It was similar, 67, right. So that was uh, a good decade before small talk came out. And the second then was small talk. So now the question is, well, what did these languages have in common? Or rather, why did object oriented programming become popular? And I think to answer that question, it would be good to see what similar 67 and small talk have in common. So why did it become popular? Was it because of encapsulation? Both Smalltalk and Simula have encapsulation. No, don't think so. Code reuse? No. Dynamic binding? Uh, probably we're closer, but not directly. Dependency inversion? That one came much later. Risk of substitution principle? Open close principle? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> It, I believe it was because of the new things you could do with object oriented programming. That's not to say that these principles are not important. Of course they are important. But to actually get the adoption, the initial adoption, you need to fulfill a need that the incumbent cannot fulfill. So what was that? So it was essentially about the relationship of methods, or, uh, operations and data structures. The traditional approach is epitomized here with a linked list. You have in a linked list, you have only two cases, the list is empty or non-empty, and then you have an unbounded number of operations. You can map over a list, you can reverse it, you can print it, get an element, insert, and so on. Uh, when Simula ca came out, that was originally, as the name implies, for simulation. And simulation actually is slightly different from this model. There you have only a fixed number of operations. Uh, these operations are typically uh, get your uh, uh, simulate your objects to the next step, print it, display it in some way, compute and aggregate. But then there's an unbounded number of things that you can simulate. So possible implementation of the simulation class would be a car or a road or a molecule or a cell, a person, a building, a city. It could be anything really. And that was a new challenge because you suddenly had an unbounded number of possible data types that all were responding to the same API, to the same protocol. Okay, so that was similar. Uh, Smalltalk was for GUI widgets. And there we actually see the same situation, a fixed number of operations with uh, something on a GUI widget. You can redraw it, you can form the bounding rectangle, you can move it and so on. And you have an unbounded number of possible widgets 
could be windows or menus or letters or videos, curves, images, anything really. And Smalltalk came out as a language on the Alto computer, first uh, personal computer right here at Xerox Park. And that was new for several reasons. One was it has a bitmap display and the second was it had a mouse. And for these reasons you could suddenly have a large number of different forms that you could present to the user. Previously with ASCII terminals you were very limited, it was, it was all letters. So that was a new thing and Smalltalk was the language for it. So both simulation and GUIs have in common that they need a way to execute a fixed API with an unknown implementation. And it certainly was possible to do this with a procedural language such as C, but it was very cumbersome. So I remember at, this, at the same time there was uh, IBM tried to compete against Windows with uh, uh, the operating OS2 that had a window manager called Presentation Manager and that was written in the original style. Uh, and it was actually very hard to program compared to something in an object-oriented language. So I think I believe that's why everybody migrated to object-oriented programming at first, or many people did, because to do these things it was just so much easier. So what does it have to do with functional programming? So I believe just like OOP did then, functional programming has lots of methodologi methodological advantages. I, believe uh, I don't need to convince you that in writing functional programs you reduce your error rate, you gain, can gain better modularity, raise your level of abstraction, get shorter code, increase your developer productivity. All these advantages are real, but I think they alone are not enough for mainstream adoption. Counter argument to that would be, well, after all, Lisp has been around for 50 years and uh, so there was time enough to prove the methodological advantages of functional programming, but it hasn't happened. And I believe that doesn't mean that these points are not true. I firmly believe they are true. But to actually get mainstream adop adoption, you need a catalyzer. Something that, that starts initial adoption beyond what we see now. I mean, I think this adoption is already super encouraging, but we need to go the next steps and reach out to um, other layers of programmers until after that the other advantages became clear to everyone. And I believe we have this catalyzer now because the catalyzer is essentially the two forces that drive a lot of software complexity today uh, which come from hardware, multi-core and cloud computing. Uh, hardware for the first time in a long time, I believe, Intel is actually not giving us necessarily the hardware that people asked for. I think everybody would like to have a 50 gigahertz Intel i7, but we don't get a 50 gigahertz Intel i7. In, in, instead, we get six cores or eight cores on that, because that's what, uh, what can be provided. And furthermore, uh, it has th this development also has led to a new uh, mode where you say, well, if you need more compute power, you fire up more servers. You distribute your load over an elastic number of servers in a data center, in the cloud, and that's your new model. That's how you get more power. But of course it will affect your programming model. You can't just rely to do everything sequentially anymore. The more servers you spread your application over, the more you have to think about uh, handling parallelism, uh, handling uh, distribution, handling possible failures of your server, and so on. And I believe that's the triple challenge that we're facing today. Parallel, how to make use of multi-cores, CPUs uh, in GPUs and clusters. Asynchronous, how to deal with asynchronous events. And distributed, how to deal with delays and failures. And it turns out that mutable state is actually a liability for each one of these. Because it uh, causes the tough problem of cache coherence. How do you invalidate your caches if there's a change somewhere over the network of races, of versioning, and so on. So the essence of functional programming then is that instead of doing these stepwise modifications of mutable state, which are problematic, we want to concentrate on transformations of immutable values. So once we are there, the question is what about objects? Should we forget about object oriented programming and all programming pure functional languages like Haskell. Well, some people would recommend that. I'm not one of them uh, because I think that what we have learned about object orientation in modeling systems, in decomposing systems, stays very valid. 
a lot of the object-oriented techniques really apply to systems architecture and uh, just turning things from imperative to functional affects that very little. So it's fundamentally the question where do we put things, uh, in what, uh, how do we structure a system, what goes where. In the end you need to think about these things because otherwise you will end up with a, a simple flat global namespace and where everything lives and we know that that can't scale to systems beyond a certain size which is way too small. So that brings me, if we want to look at objects then, then we uh, see that we have to, on the other hand, revise objects a little bit. Uh, previously objects were characterized by state, identity and behavior. But now if we want to become functional, we have to change that. I think state is no longer a property that's necessarily associated with an object. Think of Java Lang string that doesn't have mutable state in it. And it's a perfectly good object, very nice one at that. Uh, structural equality is, as we know, much better than identity. I mean, how many of us have been bitten by the fact that comparing two strings in Java might be true or false, depending on lots of other circumstances in the system? And we definitely do want to concentrate on functionality. Okay, so we want to combine then functional and object-oriented pro programming. And I believe technically that is actually quite possible. The challenges are more social. Uh, they are in a way, they lie in the way one community sees the other. That's how many functional programming people see object-oriented programming. Right? And that's how many object-oriented programming people <laughs> see functional programming. This little mad scientist uh, where you don't know whether he's crazy or dangerous or two, or the two. And that's where we are. We're so really a bit between the two chairs and uh, sometimes it's hard to sit between two chairs. Uh, we'd much, like, we're much more like it this way, sit and look into the sunset. But to get there, we need to get, need to get rid of some baggage first. Misconcept, well, concept, previous conceptions such as objects need mutable state or they need reference identity or things like that. Good. So Scala then is a bridge between those two paradigms. And to do this, it tries to be, at the same time, very orthogonal. So try to make do, because it tries to have a large span between two schools of programming that have been very, very different. It tries to be as orthogonal as possible. So to bridge this span with any as few concepts as possible, but still to keep the whole span. It tries to be expressive and to be unopinionated. So it doesn't really... Uh, care about where on this bridge you are, whether you are on the imperative side or the functional side or somewhere in the middle, but the language itself lets you do it either way. So it naturally adapts to many different programming styles. And when I started out with Scala as an academic, I thought, well, this is great, this is clearly the best of all worlds. Afterwards, I had to learn that, well, not necessarily, because then you have the big problem that, well, because you have a choice of such a broad range of styles. Which, ones do you, which one do you pick? It's a hard problem for many people. So certainly Scala is not a better Java and neither is it a Haskell on the JVM. So I want to rule out the two extremes. It's definitely something else. So I believe that what we will see emerge, but we have to work to get there, is a new fusion of functional and object-oriented programming. And what I want to do in the rest of this talk is try to make some tentative steps towards this fusion, not a big design, but just in answering just some very concrete questions and also asking you what this answer could be, uh, because sometimes one can very well disagree on them. So I want to first start with six guidelines, which I believe uh, help in writing good Scala programs. And if you disagree, then uh, we I would certainly be very happy to discuss with you at the end of the talk, uh, during question time or after we, uh, before we leave here. So the first one I believe, don't believe is controversial, that's just keep it simple. That's always good, uh, just because Scala is a language where you can master wonderfully really tough problems, really complex systems, it doesn't mean that you need to bring all these mechanisms to bear. Pick the simplest thing that does the job. Pick the simplest thing that goes from A to B without many contortions here. So I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Uh, 
Number two, uh, that's in, in a sense a special case of, uh, of that. Don't pack too much in one expression. So that's actually some code I picked from a repository that shall remain unnamed here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's a big expression, uh, pretty five lines, and takes a while to wrap your head around it what it does because you have very little help. It's just a sea of filters and flat maps and flattens and stuff like that. So it's amazing what one can get done in a single statement. <laughs> But that does not mean you have to do it. So I then tried to refactor this thing, sort of guessed a little bit what, uh, what this could be. And here's an alternative uh, way to express the same. Uh, so uh, I've broken this down to say, well, sources is get row class path and a filter. And we define a workspace root. And then we define a method files of entry that given an entry gives you all the files that belong to that and finally uh, you see a sources iterator and a flat map files of entry. So for each element in sources, give me all the files and concatenate them. So now it's sort of more legible. And it's very easy to do this thing, particularly in Scala, because Scala lets you write both vowels and defs in line. And that's one of the great things in Scala, that you can actually break out func behavior, not just values, but behavior, things that, that get called, and you don't need to go through all the overhead of adding a new method. Well, if you do that in Java, you are at least out of 10 lines of code. Here, it's a single line, and you just put it right where you need it. And really, please do that. So I believe a good guideline for Scala code should say should be every line defines something, and you name what you define. You don't you don't uh, just string together a, a long sequence of combinators before, but because you can. Number three, prefer functional. So function programming means programming without side effects. So your function should be pure, going from input to output. I, I don't think it's, I need to uh, convince you of the fact, but uh, there are good films that uh, contain the same warning here in, the, in, in, uh, in this corner. Prefer functional. That means by default, use vowels, not vars. Use recursions, so combinators, not loops. Use immutable collections over mutable. Uh, concentrate on transformations, not CRUD, not uh, create, read, update, delete code. Uh, but preferring functional means that sometimes we're going to break the rules. And it's also important when it's OK to break the rules. So I don't want to be dogmatic. Scala has a mutable area, a, a mutable part. And that's not just to pull in all those Java programmers and then wean them off. If they, if everybody believes the mutable part is there for a purpose. So sometimes mutable gives better performance, in particular if you're dealing with collections that are very, very large, significant percentage of your total available memory, say, then definitely you want to be mutable. Immutable is known to consume mem more memory than mutable. And sometimes, even though not that often, but still sometimes, it adds convenience. So here's uh, some uh, points where uh, adding a var actually would add convenience. So my fourth advice would be not to diabolize local state. Local state. So why does mutable state lead, could lead to complexity? Well, the complexity is really in the interaction between different things. That's always where complexity comes from. It, it comes from an interaction that you between different strands that you can't control very well. And in the case of mutable state, that interaction is clearly that uh, you have different program parts that interact through these variables in a temporal fashion. So you have to make sure that a variable is set before it is read, or a lock is grabbed before you enter a critical region, and so on. So that's the tricky part, because this temporal fashion is not manifest in the program code. Uh, code. It's a property that arises from program execution, and that, that is very hard to track. So that also means that state is the more harmful, the more elements of your program it touches. Or, as, a, as the counter conclusion, if state is local, it's actually not that harmful at all. It's just maybe a nuisance, or you might not like it for, for aesthetic reasons, but it's actually, you can't really argue that it's very, very, it, it, it complicates your program very much. So local state is less harmful than global state. So here's an example where I actually sometimes use local state. So that's from, I think, the classified parser, and you see code like, 
uh, var interfaces var uh, equals par uh, parse class header. And then you say, if there's an annotation, then add class file annotation to my interfaces. So that means that essentially, like telling you, well, interfaces is what's in the class, uh, class file header. But second rule modification, if the thing is an annotation, then class file annotation is also part of the interfaces. That's what this says. Now, that uses a var and an assignment. Uh, what would it take to write this purely functional? Well, not that much, so you could write it this way. You could say parsed interfaces is parsed class header. Interfaces is if uh, the thing is an annotation, then parsed interfaces plus class file annotation as parsed interfaces. Fair enough, it's a small difference, but the functional version is clearly longer than the non-functional version and not necessarily clearer. So I believe it actually comes down to a question of naming. The functional version, if really you want to make this drive this point home that there's a difference between parsed interfaces and interfaces, then do it that way. It's perfectly good even though it's longer. You shouldn't use the, the shortest one each time. But if you think that this distinction is actually a nuisance and all you're interested in is what is the final interfaces, then I would say, well, you don't need to jump through these hoops. You can just use a local variable. Uh, the qualification here is uh, the variable really should have a very clearly delineated scope. So yeah, ideally, after these two lines here, uh, the uh, method should or the block should finish and you should just return interfaces. Then it's clear that nothing bad will happen with this variable. If that's a global variable, then I would say no, by, by all means no, because this global variable, of course, then is exposed. You don't know what code uh, interacts with it and even if your current version is clean and nothing interacts with it it's just an invitation for the next guy that comes along or, or gal that comes along to actually change that and do some some interaction good more local state examples so here's another example where local state is useful say you have a sequence of items with price and discount attributes and you want to at the end at the cash register you want to get the sum of all the prices and also the sum of all the discounts that you receive. So that's easy, you just do uh, twice a map and a sum. So total prices, items, map, price, sum and total discount the same with discount. But now I want to say okay, now do the same with just one sequence traversal. Maybe items is an iterator and you can traverse it only once. What do you do then? Well, you could do it in a purely functional fashion, then the canonical version would be, I believe, a fold left. And that's the code that you would get. So in the end, you define both total price and total discount. It's a fold left. Your initial values are zero for both. And then your function takes the current T price and T discount and an item and adds things up. It's doable, but it's not super pretty. And uh, Another thing that uh, is uh, notable here is that the flow of data is not very apparent in this thing. So that's the thing you define. Those are the initial values. You have to sort of match them up by position and then they flow into this thing somehow and then the thing finally goes over there. It's all very convoluted. And uh, I must say that if you write the imperative version then things uh, do uh, are, are a bit clearer here. So. You just define the uh, variables total price and total discount and then you iterate through items and you add the item price and item discount to the thing. So again, there you say, well, probably if the, the functional version is in this case more convoluted than the imperative one, so why not? If this is a local uh, uh, computation and local price and local discount are just variables that you use to produce this, don't shy away from considering this solution as well. But uh, the counterpoint of that is, since I said state is the more problematic, the more global it is, that means if you have mutable objects, then uh, you, that's something typically much more critical and problematic uh, because mutable objects tend to encapsulate global state. So the state is visible for everyone that can get access to this object. That could be a large graph. And encapsulate sounds good, but it does not make the global state go away. So there's still a lot of potential for complex entanglements. So one thing there is that when you say don't use or 
be careful with mutable objects, it's actually not so clear what that is. What is it? What is a mutable object? Uh, is that an object that contains bars? Not necessarily. How about this one? We have a uh, class buffer proxy and it takes a buffer, an array buffer of t, and there's a put method which forwards to the append method and there's a length method. Is that mutable? I would say yes. So you could say, okay, let's modify this. Maybe we should count mutable structures also just like vars. So should not contain vars, should not contain uh, collections or any other structures that are mutable. But then what about this? Uh, so here we have a class memo and that class contains something which is definitely mutable. So it's a mutable which we cache map in this value and then apply would uh, do a get or else update. So it would, uh, given a key x, it would uh, look into in our memo map if the key is present, it would return the current value. If not, it would use the function to compute the current value, the, the, the value for the key, store it in the map and return it afterwards. Is that an object, uh, is that object mutable? If I create a new instance of memo, what do you think? Who thinks it's mutable? Okay, who thinks it's immutable? Uh, half, half, see, you don't agree. And, and the answer is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if you assume your functions are immutable, that you pass this object is indeed immutable. So if you create an object like this, new memo with the incrementation function, that object is immutable. Uh, why? Well, but the definition I propose here is that I say an object is mutable if its functional behavior depends on its history. So what that means is that the effect of a method, both result and what other effects it might have, uh, depends on what happened to your object before that method was called. If that makes a difference, the object is mutable. If it doesn't make a difference, that means the method returns the same result every time you call it, then the object is immutable. Now this memo object, this will return the same result every time you call it. It will do it in, on different routes. The first time it will take this incrementation function and use it to compute the result. But one, and once it has a key, it will simply give you a look up the key, but it will be the same result. Hopefully the second time around it will return the thing faster. Well, not for the incrementation function, but for a more complicated function, it will do it faster. Okay, on the other hand, things get more murky if I actually use a side effecting function for this memo object because then if you analyze things carefully, you can say you can observe a side effect, namely that the counter gets incremented the first time you call memo with a certain key because the function gets evaluated, but the second time the counter stays the same because it will just look it up in the map. So a memo object mixed with mutable functions is itself mutable. Mutable pollutes a little bit the objects here. Good. Uh, last advice, don't stop improving too early. So often I found that I could shrink code by a factor of 10 and make it more legible at the same time. But I didn't do, do that in a single step. I did it step after step after step and often the steps were spread out over several days or weeks where in, in the meantime I did other things. So typically what, what would happen is I have a rough solution and said, ah, I can improve it this way. And I was, would, would be happy and go away with a better solution and I would come back a day or two later and said, well, let's have another look at my great solution and then say, ah, but I know another way how I can make it even better. And that I could iterate several times until I have something that is really super tight and, and good. And that's okay. So some people are frustrated by that. Why can't I have the best solution immediately every time? And I think that's uh, in a, that's unavoidable and it's maybe the wrong way to look at it. The way you look at it should be that, isn't it great that you can derive the pleasure of improving your solutions several times? Uh, so not just once, but you can actually have this pleasure several times. And I think that's an effect for every one of us. And I don't propose busy work to just change from one solution to another, but often these refactorings really give you clearer code and in Scala you can have 
you can go a long way and I think that's, that's, we should embrace that and it's a good thing. So keep going. So I want to uh, then uh, in the last part of my talk present you a set of choices uh, where one can often argue for one or the other. Uh, there are different styles to present things and we can discuss when which style would be appropriate. The first choice would be uh, infix uh, operations versus uh, dot. So as you know, Scala unifies operators and method calls. So every operator is a method. And that means that you can also use every method which has a parameter as an infix operator. So you have a choice. Do you use the dot method parent syntax or do you use the infix operator syntax? Which one would you choose here? Well, no contest, you would choose the left one, the plus. Right? Uh, nobody would write plus as a method. Uh, what about this one here? Would you write xsmapf inline or xs.mapf? Who would write xsmap inline, the, the left part? And the dot method part? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, at Scala Days, I think we had slightly more votes for the dot method part. So. Uh, the West Coast seems to be a little bit more operator-centric than the East Coast. <laughs> but it's a, it's a split anyway. So here what I saw was about uh, maybe 40% infix operator, 60% methods, and at Scala Days it was maybe one-third, two-thirds, two if, I, if I do a rough estimate. Okay, uh, what about this? Uh, X, again, I have infix operators, but now I have a sequence of them and the right hand we have uh, them lined up by dots. Who would write it like on the left? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Three, okay. Well, if you look at legibility, then I believe the, the, the left hand side uh, loses clearly. So it's, it's very hard to see in a long sequence like that. Uh, what are the verbs and what are the subjects or the objects in, in a thing like that. Because you'd have to count. So XS is the first one, flat map is a word, then fun would be a subject, filter not is a verb. Well, it's, it gets very hard to keep track. The dots give you much more guidance for that. Okay, but the problem is it's an annoying choice you have to make. So let me propose, just for the sake of fixing one standard, something to, to, to fix that. So the first thing I think that's uncontroversial, if a method name is symbolic, we use infix. For alphanumeric me method names, I believe one can use infix. It's a choice, optional, if there's only one alphanumeric operation in the expression. So something like mapping add filter is uh, okay. And I, I typically use that myself, in particular, if the method name is short, like is or contains or add or stuff, stuff like that. But once it's more than one, then I would prefer chained operators. Like uh, if we wrote uh, this out in, uh, in uh, infix, then we would have a problem. Uh, for instance, you would then read mapping, space add, space filter, and here it would throw you because you would sort of parse filter as a verb, but it can of course be also used as a, as a subject. A filter is a it's perfectly good, good name for a subject. So I believe we sort of rely on our parsing of these things on implicitly knowing what are the combinators, and that's an assumption that you, might be true for you, but not for your readers. Newcomers to the code base might really not know what the typical combinators in Scala are called. So they would have a big legibility problem here. Choice number two, alphabetic versus symbolic. Well, that's an, uh, an old one, and I think we fought these battles last year, though, uh, but we are sort of mostly beyond them now. I think we are, we are, all, uh, we are mostly set on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a way to decide between those two. So we know that identifiers in Scala can be alphanumeric or symbolic, so operators can be either methods. How do you choose? Do you write XS map F or XS whatever? <laughs> nah. Do you write vector plus MX or vector add MX? Again, yeah, you pro well, probably would use a plus here, right? So you would use the symbolic name. Do you write XS fold left Z up or Z slash colon XS up? Who writes XS fold left Z up? Yeah. And who writes the other 
Well, a few, a few, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, I, I was guilty of that one, uh, of introducing that one, because it's really cool. So let me... <laughs> <laughs> let, let me explain to you why this is really cool. So a uh, fold left is actually very hard to parse because uh, uh, so one uh, one guy, uh, somebody told me, well, look, fold left, I always thought it, it's called fold left because the operation goes from right to left, but that's actually wrong, it goes from left to right. It's confusing. The other thing that's confusing about fold left is that uh, the when you write them out, the, the zero actually ends up on the left-hand side. So it's zero up xs1, up xs2, and so on. But here the zero comes after the xs. That's the other thing that's really confusing. Whereas here everything is lined up right, and the great intuition is think dominoes. So that thing here is a domino, and it starts with a zero, and it's, <laughs> then it goes, <laughs> right? And, and, that, and that, that's the whole thing. So brilliant, I thought it was brilliant. And nobody, nobody here, but you see, that's the fallacy. You think it's brilliant, and I'm sure you can think of some of these operators as well that are brilliant, but your audience has no clue what you thought, and they are just <laughs> completely puzzled, right? So that's why I think, uh, in retrospect, even though maybe some of you are using this operator now, maybe after Scala, there's quite a few people say, oh, you have me convinced that it's, it's a cool operator after all. But, <laughs> But it's, you, you have to sort of really, even if you think it's brilliant, and it probably is, uh, you, your, your typical readers of your programs have no clue what this thing should mean, and, and you probably won't have a chance to educate them all. So it's much better to stick to alphabetic. Good. Here's another one. Uh, that's one. I was more lucky with that one. So after the uh, slash colon debacle and several other debacles, I was really um, loath to introduce another symbolic operator, but I did it anyway. So <laughs> there's a triple question mark in 210, and that was an. I think that was a uh, complete win. So everybody immediately took to triple question mark. It's the right thing. And I believe that means that for triple question mark, that was clear what it meant. What else could it mean than this thing is undefined? You have to define it. <laughs> and I think furthermore, it's good because if uh, we had picked something like to do or undefined, that's a thing that sort of drowns in a sea of text. Whereas triple question mark sticks out. You see immediately triple question mark, ah, that's where I have to work. So that's the advantage here. So to sum it up, my advice would be, Use symbolic only if the meaning is understood by your target audience beforehand. Uh, the operator is standard in your application domain, typically example are mathematical operators, and or you would like to draw attention to the operator that was the triple question mark uh, because it usually sticks out better than alphabetic. And if you go only on reason three, it's a very risky thing. So probably you want to have at least one or two as well. Good. Choice number three. Loops, recursions, or combinators. So often for the same functionality, to, you can use one of the three. So here we have a simple loop. Uh, it steps through numbers up to a limit, and it tests a qualified uh, predicate, and it will give you the first number that qualifies, uh, or limit if uh, none of the numbers qualify. So you can do it that way. Or you can use recursion, so here's the recursive purely functional solution for the same thing. You say recur with an uh, integer argument if that's greater or equal limit, or i qualifies return i, otherwise return recur i plus 1, and you start with recur 0. Or you could use predefined combinators, so that would be the, uh, that would do the trick, so you say go from 0 until length, find the one that qualifies uh, that would give you an option result, get the option, or if the option is none, return length. Which one would you choose here? The loop, the recursion, recursion or the combinators? Who would choose the loop? A couple, yeah. Recursion, somewhat more. The combinators, large, oh yeah, that drowns, that drowns the rest. Okay, let's do another one. How about this one, XS mapf? Thing with list buffers does the same thing, or recursion does the same thing. Well, I guess they're pretty clear everybody would pick map. I don't even I don't dare to ask you. I don't think. 
how about this one? So that's XS group two two list map case list x y x times y. Uh, then we have a, the same thing with a loop. So we have a buffer, and we step through a list. And as long as it's not empty, we take two elements off the list, put them put their product in the buffer, and advance by two elements. Or we have the same thing as a recursive function. So same thing as the loop. We if the list has two elements, then we take them, form the product, recurse. If the list is nil, we give you nil. Which one would you pick here? Who would pick the group thing, the combinators? Okay, still a lot, a bit less than previously. The, the while loop? No, nobody wants the while loop. The recursion? Okay, good. You have good taste. So the, <laughs> so the while loop, I, I believe also, is clearly the worst here. You don't need a while loop here. Uh, it's, it's just distracting. It's also the longest of the three solutions. The question, yeah? what happens if uh, a pusher is huge? Yeah, then uh, I still wouldn't use the while loop. Uh, I, I get to that, yeah. <laughs> uh, the grouped version is uh, it's great if you know the combinators, uh, because it uses some fancy one, like grouped is only available on iterators, and it uses some fancy construction with this pattern matching closure and things like that. So it's great if you know the combinators and everybody else on your team knows them as well. That's sort of the, the, the danger to fall into. You know the combinators, but maybe your coworkers don't, and then they would be needlessly puzzled by this code. And I believe the, the third one, that's actually underrated. So I think one very good style of functional programming is essentially first order functional programming, uh, not using any higher order functions, just recursive pattern matching equations. And that that's the trick, and it's actually sometimes it's usually often longer than combinators, uh, but it might be actually be easier to grasp for newcomers, and furthermore, it tends to be more efficient as well. So if you have, uh, if you're unsure whether you need all the power of this thing is very very long, then the recursive solution here is actually not good. Yeah, right. So that's that's a pot potential uh, downside here. Often the, you can. But you could massage the solution so that, that it does become tail recursive. That's a standard approach here. Uh, so my only reason for the while loop would be, yeah, if the list is very long, then use a list buffer, probably. Yeah, that's true. If not, then use recursion, or uh, if you know the combinators, use them. Good. If we so often these pattern matching recursive solutions are tail recursive, and you can verify by just putting tail rec on them. And if they are tail recursive, then they do just run just run just as fast as a while loop. So there's not really a reason for performance to go for the imperative solution. This one isn't. So why does Scala have all three? Well, combinators they're clearly in most cases the easiest to use, and anyway they're all done in the library. Uh, recursive functions are clearly the bedrock of functional programming. You want them together with pattern matching because that's much clearer and safer than the tests and selections. And loops, well, maybe Scala could have done okay without loops, but they are familiar and they're sometimes the simplest solution, sometimes. So my recommendation would be consider combinators first, seems most of you are already doing that. If this becomes too tedious or efficiency is a big concern, Try to fall back on tail recursive functions, and loops can be used in simple cases or when the computation inherently modifies state. So if that's something, sometimes your computation wants to modify state, a mutable map or something like that. If you do that anyway, then uh, you might as well write a loop. And loops might actually be the simplest if you inherit, if you modify in one iteration a lot of different pieces of mutable state. Then, then a loop can be, can be a good choice. Uh, choice number four, procedures or equals. So Scala has special syntax for unit return, returning procedures. So here's a swap method that just swaps two elements of an array. So that's a, a standard implementation. And you can write just essentially the block afterwards without writing equals and colon unit. Or you could write colon unit and equals. Then it looks just like a normal function. So which one do you choose here? Who chooses the first one? Quite a lot, and it's actually in the official style guide too. Who chooses the second one? A uh, bit less, yeah. 
Yeah, that was actually, I believe, a mistake, a historical accident. Uh, so the reason why procedure syntax was introduced is that very, very early on, when we did like the first Scala tutorials, I was concerned that I'd have to explain unit too early to Java programmers. So the thing was we wanted to write like a, a sort function and uh, the problem was I wanted to get to the thing, well, how do we write a sort function and uh, just to show them how to map Java to Scala and things like that. And then there was this unit and I would have to do this whole detour to say, well, unit is sort of like void, but not really because it's a type of a value. And I was scared of that. So I said, well, let's just hide this whole thing, sweep it under the carpet. We have special syntax. It looks more familiar to Java programmers anyway. I believe actually that was a mistake because it traded simplicity for ease of use familiarity. So uh, it's definitely more familiar, but it's not as easy. Now you have two versions to do this and furthermore the, the easy one uh, has a bad trap, namely when you write colon unit and then something, then the compiler gets thoroughly confused because what it thinks is that you're actually defining an abstract method with result type unit and then it thinks this thing should be a refinement of this result type. So there's an ambiguity. And initially in the first version, so a long time in the Scala compiler, you got absolutely confusing error messages. I think the one you got is uh, probably somewhere here that uh, uh, probably it says it wanted a colon here or something like that. So in the middle of this it would get confused because it said, well, this is not a type refinement. This is statements, but I don't want statements. We have put a lot of work in, in that in, since Scala 2.8 or 2.9, I'm not exactly when, sure when that we special case this thing and the compiler then says, well, you probably meant to write an equal sign here, something like that. But it's still very confusing and I think it's it's not worth the added complexity this, this opens up. So my advice would be don't use procedure syntax and it, it turns out that uh, at Scala Days the people say they will change the style guide and also uh, in IntelliJ where you actually have a refactoring from here to here, so automatic refactoring in IntelliJ, they uh, promised me they'd turn that around. So in the, the next IntelliJ <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a refactoring from here to here. Good. Uh, choice number five, private versus nested. So say you have an outer method here that uses a helper method for some of its functionality. So I've said before, it's actually really cool that Scala has this capability to put uh, methods in line so that they don't pollute the global namespace and they're much less overhead. So the question is, should you always do this? So always put it into the innermost scope or are there reasons to put this method sometimes into an outer scope? I think in most cases you want to put this into the inner scope. Definitely you want to do so that would be the outer scope alternative, sorry. Uh, so you would have now the method is Java, you make it private, you put it here and then you call it like that. So which one do you choose? So I think in most cases you want the first one, you want to put it where the usage is, uh, with maybe one exception. So you definitely want to nest if that means you can save a parameter. So here I have modified the isJava method and now it actually refers to owner. With owner is Java, then there's a big advantage to keeping it where it is because that means you don't have to pass owner into the method. You save on a parameter and that's always good. Um, but let's say you don't become, you don't capture anything. There is no reference to any outer thing. Then you could argue that there's a legibility problem the other way around because when you look at this method, you say, well, does it, is it affected by anything out, out here or not? And for, for a small method like is Java, that's very easy. You just scan the line and says, well, it's not affected. Like that was this thing here. Well, obviously it doesn't refer to owner. But now think is Java is actually a method that's 10, line long, 10 lines long. Then that becomes a mental effort to see, well, does it use owner or does it not use owner? So there you might have a case where you say, well, it actually might be preferable to move is Java out into a private method because then it becomes clear that, well, it doesn't need anything from the inner scope. 
So my recommendation would be prefer nesting. Uh, if either you can save on parameters, then it's a no-brainer, or also prefer nesting for smallish functions, even if nothing is captured. And secondly, don't nest many levels deep. That sort of goes to don't overdo it, because if you nest many levels deep, it often becomes very difficult to align just your, the, the thing in your head to say which, which, which method goes where. Last choice, pattern matching versus dynamic dispatch. That sort of brings us back into the object-oriented versus functional, uh, or the object-oriented yeah, versus imperative functional uh, debate that started when object-oriented programming started. So let's say you have a hierarchy of shapes, like here you have a base class shape, and you have then sh uh, subclasses, circle, rectangle, points, and they're all shapes. And you want to write a method to compute the area of a shape. There are two ways to do that. You can write uh, an area method using pattern matching like this one. So you just have cases of all the different shapes and do the right, put the right formula in place for each one. Or you could have area as an abstract method in class shape that gets then implemented by each subclass. Which one do you choose? Who would choose the uh, pattern matching version? Okay, how about, and who would choose the uh, method? Okay, a bit more than half, yeah, okay. So the method has it. Um, that's actually an interesting question, and I've been going back and forth a little bit on that one. Uh, so first, before we go to the answer, why the Scala, why Scala has both? Well, pattern matching is the functional part, comes from functional part, and it definitely is very convenient, a lot of, uh, uh, code becomes very concise and clear. Dynamic dispatch comes from object-oriented programming and it's the core mechanism for extensible systems. So you want both. But how do you choose between them? So I believe that the answer to that is it depends whether your system should be extensible or not and in what direction it would be extensible. And that brings us back to this question how object-oriented programming started. So if you foresee extensions with new data alternatives, dynamic dispatch is better. So for instance, if we had added a class, say triangle, to our shapes, then here it would be very smooth. We just add a new case class, and uh, that would have its own implementation of the area method, and we're done. Whereas if we use the previous uh, method uh, to, do, to define area, we'd have to define both the class and we'd have to go back to this area method and think of the case. So we'd have to think of two locations instead of one, which is harder to keep in your head. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, foresee that you would like to add typically two me new methods later, then I believe pattern matching is advantageous because uh, otherwise you end up here touching all of these classes and adding a new method to each of them, whereas, whereas with the pattern matching method you would have only a single point that you need to exchange, e extend. Sorry. Uh, if the system is closed and complex, so you don't see, uh, foresee any extensibility requirements, I believe one should also choose pattern matching. And that's something where I've sort of changed uh, been going around the compiler for Scala is a closed and complex system. So typically you don't add new syntax tree cases every week and also the functionality is pretty fixed what you do with it. And uh, the um, current version actually uses dynamic dispatch a lot and I'm sort of shifting over to pattern matching because it gives me a single point where I can understand the logic. The problem with the dynamic dispatch is that the logic is really dispersed. When I want to say, well, what is now not the area of a shape, but let's say the, um, uh, the symbol that corresponds to a type, uh, then if I have a single definition that says, well, for this type it's that, for that type it's that, for that type it's that, it's something that I can grasp in my head. If I have to go through all the many hundreds of lines of class definitions that do the different types, it's much, much more difficult to actually uh, compile and collect this knowledge into something that is a, a, a thing that is, has, has a core definition. So that's why I actually believe that when in doubt, prefer the pattern matching solution, prefer this one. It gives you a single point that, where you can understand the logic. You have an objection. 
or yeah. runtime? Good, that's a point. Yeah, yeah. With virtual methods, the compiler will inform you if you forgot one. Uh, whereas with uh, with uh, pattern matching, it will do the same thing, but only if the base class is sealed. So sealed base. But on the other hand, if you have a closed uh, system, then I would very much encourage you do seal your base classes uh, because that's that's when things really start to work with your pattern matches as well. Okay. Uh, what if you want to extend in both dimensions? Uh, so that's sort of the opposite for complex and closed, but a system where you want to add new methods and new data types. Well, one thing that we found out to work found to work pretty well in that case is to essentially put a pattern matching solution inside a class that you can inherit. So we would have something like a shape handler and it has an area method that essentially deals with all the known shapes and you can add further methods to that. And then there could be once, if you add new shapes somewhere else in your system, there could be an extra shape handler and that would add, handle them the new shapes and in, would fall back to the super handler for the, 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 the shapes that you have already seen in the base class. That's one possible solution. There are many others. It's a well-studied problem. It's called the expression problem. Uh, and uh, the expression problem is essentially about extensibility uh, of both data and operations in uh, typically object-oriented systems. It was the, the, the name was coined by my uh, colleague Phil Wadler. Uh, the expression problem uh, he chose because his standard example were arithmetic expressions, syntax trees that, do, uh, that, that describe arithmetic expressions. And of course it's about expressiveness as well, expressiveness of languages. So conclusions. We've seen lots of puzzling choices, so I didn't want to hide them from you, but go right into that and give you some of the design or some of the criteria with which one might choose one or the other. And I think it's natural to have all these choices because after all we are breaking new ground here. So my main advice of the talk would be uh, keep things simple. Think of good names. So I think naming is really crucial uh, in everything. Think, so think of many names and good names for the intermediate results in your program and have fun. And I think if you follow these three, then you're doing all right. Thank you. So we have some time for question, I think 15 minutes, something like that. So the question was, uh, should you prefer large interfaces with many methods over small interfaces with them essentially having implicit decorators that uh, provide the other functionality? Uh, I would say the latter. So uh, I believe in a, a, a good design should have small interfaces that are more modular that get into these decorators. Now, of course, the follow-on question is why don't Scala collections uh, have that? Why are they they're not designed that way? And I believe there the, the answer is, well, we laid the groundwork that we could do that only much later. In 2.10, uh, we essentially had essentially very convenient and free implicit decorators with value classes and implicit classes. Before, the overhead was quite large, both in the, in the notation to actually write these implicit decorators, and what's for collections more important, uh, it would have had a performance impact because every time you call a method, you would have created a new wrapper object and we didn't want to pay that price. Let's say you call, let's say, the, a, a drop to thing, which is very fast on lists and actually creating this wrapper would actually have slowed this down maybe by, 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 uh, by several times. Uh, so that's why we didn't do it. But I think now that we have it, uh, if we would get a chance to redesign the collections and make it more modular, that would be a good idea. So generally the advice would be uh, implicit parameters and decorators are great and they're, they're really a great tool to, to modularize your system. So by all means, consider those. Okay, so the, the question was that uh, uh, they found that implicit parameters work really well, but implicit conversions pose lots of problems. Uh, so, uh, what advice to give there? So, yeah, I mean, I completely echo your, your sentiment. Implicit parameters generally work really well and are, as far as I can see, not really problematic uh, in most cases. Implicit conversions, uh, essentially there's only one thing where, where implicit con con uh, conversions are unproblematic, and that's essentially when they 
introduce new methods that you immediately consume them. That's what I call implicit decorators. So essentially you add new methods in the way you would in other languages with, the, with extension methods, but it's essentially an, an, an implicit that injects a method and then you call it. And for that we now have special syntax in Scala 2.10 that's implicit classes. So with an implicit class you can essentially fire this thing up. Um, that leaves then the third part where you say you have an implicit conversion from type A to type B and that's sort of kept in there as a convenience thing. And then it's true that the more of these things you introduce, typically the more problems you cause yourself. So a couple, you get away with them fine, but if you overdo it and you have more and more, then things get ambiguous very quickly and confusing very quickly. So that's also the reason why these, these third kind of implicit conversions, we have now put them uh, behind a lock. Uh, the lock is called uh, language import, so you now have to write import language dot implicit conversions if you want to use that and I would say yes in most cases I would not advise to use them. So I, I would say if you have a policy in your team don't use that uh, what's behind that lock then I would say that's I think probably a good choice. You might have in some specialized reasons where you want that and then of course you can get it by importing it but uh, by default I would say it's a good choice not to use them. Ah, uh, You cannot extend the case class. Uh, yes, uh, that's true. So it, it's really only for further alternatives. So one cannot, but, but what was the question? If you cannot extend the case class, then, oh, you say, okay, now I get it, yeah. So I believe what you're getting at is to say, well, if I use dynamic dispatch, I can have gradual refinements and overrides along a tree. And those I can't do with a plain pattern match because it would mean I would have to have case classes that inherit case classes. And that's true, yeah. So if you want to do that, not just have a single method that you implement then in, in essentially a flat sum of types, but you want to override this method in further, in further refinements, then dynamic dispatch is a choice for you. But I, I should say, if you do that uh, a lot, then also your program code will not be very legible. This is something, I mean, a lot of overrides in many different cases are uh, typically something that is not very legible because you not only have you, have, do you have to look at all the possible cases now, but you might think you have something because you look at it in the base class and then actually in the subclass, no, it's not the implementation you were thinking of. So I would do that, I mean there are certainly reasons for doing it this way, typically performance, so if you have a clear contract of what your method is and you have special implementations and special, special implementation subclasses that just do the same job but faster, nothing against that. But I, I, I think one has to again see what, what, what are the boundaries of applic applicability here. So would for monadic operations, uh, one can express them with for yield or with map flat map, which to prefer. Um, I think that for many people flat map is kind of cool but also confusing what it is. Uh, so I would say uh, once you have flat maps in your sequence, uh, I would typically use a for yield instead. It's simpler. Most people, most people understand this better. So technically it means if you have more than one generator then you need a flat map, then you could use a for, 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 for expression and it would be typically more legible. So nothing against map and filter but flat map, uh, let's keep it a secret. Let's hide <laughs> it. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. So the third alternative would be to use the same thing with type classes. So we'd have to see well, for area. Yeah. So type classes, I didn't think of type classes because, uh, so I imagine that what you are after is to have a type class area, uh, oh, area computer that essentially has implementations for circle, rectangle and the other shapes. Uh, that's a slightly different behavior because then your area actually depends on the static type of something, not on the runtime type. So it's a different ball game. So my recommendation here would be if your architecture is such that uh, the dispatch always depends on the static type, so you, you know that, that you won't need to rely on the runtime type, uh, 
then uh, indeed type classes are, are a good choice and probably the preferable choice. It goes a little bit in the direction of the first question which says, well, should we put everything in one big API and thereby make it overridable and dynamically dispatchable or should we put type classes? So the answer was prefer type classes, but of course that means that essentially these things have the same implementation uh, for all dynamic subtypes of any static type that you see. If you can assure that, then I would say type classes are great. In this case, I didn't assume that, so I didn't consider type classes. Yeah. One yeah, we had, um, <clears throat> I think we had Eugene uh, here last week, uh, speak last week at a meetup. <clears throat> and maybe he has already said a little bit, so but I think we are sort of, uh, we have a roadmap for what we want to do with macros now. So the current state is macros are in 2.10, but as, as an experimental feature. So experimental means uh, they might go away or be, or be fundamentally changed in future versions. Uh, one shouldn't rely on them for anything that, uh, that, that is... Um, uh, is crucial for to be brought forward. Experiments is fine, but currently not much more than that. So um, I believe what we are ending up with in uh, one of the future versions is a, a restricted version of macros, which I call black box macros. So uh, uh, a macro is just a function. It takes arguments that, uh, that are expression trees and it gives you back a new expression tree. and the crucial point, which I, I believe makes a diff big difference, is whether this function is type-checked the way it's declared or the way it's expanded. So let's say we have a function that says, well, I give you a, um, I take a string or an expression yielding a string and I give you back um, an, an, uh, an object. Uh, so uh, then when you expand the macro actually the expansion would give you back something much more fancy like a list or, or a boolean or things like that. The question is which of the two types does the type checker see? Object, the one that's declared as the return type of the method, or string? If the answer is the second one, that's the current state of, ex of, of ex experimental macros, then that opens the door to do a lot of fancy tricks with types because macros can essentially produce new stuff that only has to type check on expansion on, on for, the, for, the, for the, the declared type can be any and nobody cares. And that means you open the floodgates for essentially uh, language extensions that can be as wild as you can imagine. Unfortunately, it also means that there's no chance you can uh, support this thing in uh, plain editors or IDEs because it would mean type checking a program means expanding your macros. You have to expand your macros before you can type check. So we want, I think we uh, have said, well, this was great while it lasted, but we don't want to standardize on that. So we, we, will, we will standardize on black box macros where we say, well, essentially the type that's declared in the macro is the type you get. That means that IDEs can actually type check your program perfectly well without macro expansion. And it also means that macro expansion essentially, essentially it's there to improve your program in some way without fundamentally changing it. So macros that would be possible under this new scheme is, for instance, taking a for each over a range and replacing it by a while loop. Or something that could check whether a spore, there was a talk about spores, uh, that means a closure has escaping references and giving you a warning or an error if it hasn't. Or uh, things like uh, uh, optimizing your collection so that loops are fused and things like that. So all these things will remain possible, but you will essentially not be able to sort of undermine the type systems with macros. And I think that's sort of a good compromise of power and, uh, and tooling and understandability. So I think we'll converge on that one. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. Why did we choose not to have lazy evaluation by default? Um, there, there, there are many problems with lazy evaluation. So uh, the first is that, of course, it's incompatible with side effects. Um, if you ask Simon Peyton Jones, uh, he says, well, that's actually good because the biggest, the best things with lazy, with lazy evaluation in Haskell is it, it has kept us honest uh, about side effects. Uh, 
And that's why Haskell essentially has a very strict regime where any side effects have to be in a monad. Uh, so if you're Haskell, that's the right thing. But if you come from a language like Scala, which started with side effects from the beginning, lazy evaluation is fundamentally incompatible with that, universal lazy evaluation. In, uh, even if you, if you use lazy values in Scala, and I would encourage you, that's good practice, it also means you should be very careful with side effects, with mixing that with side effects, because it's uh, rather, uh, it can be rather surprising when things are evaluated and side effects are all about temporal orderings. So the two things don't mix. Um, there's, there, there are more things that are problematic with lazy evaluation, uh, universal lazy evaluation, in particular uh, memory graphs. So often when you uh, evaluate lazily everything, you essentially you get automatic loop unrolling. So often your loop or recursive computation uh, gets unrolled that you get essentially the full graph of all the unrollings in your loop in your data structure. And that can of course be huge. So uh, Haskell programs can be sometimes rather difficult to debug in their space behavior. And again, that's not what we wanted for, 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 for Scala. So I think that's mo the two main reasons. I actually believe we hit a pretty good compromise to give you lazy evaluation on demand. And I personally haven't really seen many reasons to go be beyond that, to, frank, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't ask me. I never wrote anything with Java beans, so. <laughs> Yeah, with the getters and setters, well, you can, you know, you can have this. State. You can have this annotation. They define state, yeah, probably. So, nice proper way to have immutables. My advice would be use play and aka and don't use Java beans. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the question was uh, can we, like, uh, uh, drop the static typing requirements locally and then get to types? Uh, so in a sense, we, we have that already. So we have dynamic. Uh, you can use dynamic. It's again under lock because it's dangerous. So you have to import it, import language.dynamic. Uh, but uh, then dynamic is perfectly good. It gives you dynamic types. So uh, you can have methods. Any method call on the dynamic is dynam it's dynamically chosen. So it's dynamically resolved. Um, and to get back to static typing, we also have a good means, and that's pattern matching. So I can take an object. I don't know what it is. But once I have put the patterns in place in each pattern, then typically I do know what the types of my variables are. So I think with those two, we have that. Um, I haven't seen that much reason to go that way, except, like you say, interfacing with something that is inherently dynamic, JSON or JavaScript as a whole, or things like that. Then I believe it's very important, and that's why we also added dynamic. So, there was a very nice talk about uh, Scala.js at Scala Days by Sebastian Dorene, who had met a lot of interest. And dynamic is essentially a cornerstone of that because that lets us talk with uh, JavaScript programs directly. And if they happen to have types, because that, that project actually makes, send, makes use of any TypeScript type annotations, which now also exist for JavaScript, then we use them. If we don't have them, then we fall back to dynamic. For these reasons, for these uh, um, scenarios, it's actually, I believe it's very good to have dynamic and it's promising. One last question. <laughs> do we plan to extend macros to do aspect or any programming? Um, over the whole, probably not. There are some things we are looking at, we haven't figured out yet. What we would like to do is something like bean, getters, and setters, things like that. So essentially code generation of methods. That's currently special case. If you write bean property on a, on a field, you get the getter and setter. Uh, it would be nice to be able to generalize that, to make that uh, within the capabilities of a macro that takes the load off the compiler. The compiler doesn't have to special case it anymore, and it opens the door to, uh, to other people to do stuff like that. But I think we probably want to want to keep it at that, not do uh, point cuts and stuff like that. I don't think that would happen. OK, I think we should wrap up then. Thank you very much for being here.